Uh, thank all of you for being here. Uh, it's such a great honor to see such a large turnout. Uh, uh, but of course, I'm under no illusion. You guys are all here for the air conditioning, right? Um, I, uh, it's a great honor anytime anybody turns out to hear anything I have to say. Um, so uh, that's, that's really good. Uh, the thought has crossed my mind, though, that uh, <clears throat> you know you're over the hill when they start inviting you in to reminisce about the old days, you know, rather than what I'm doing now. So, but that's okay. I have some reminiscences. And uh, before I begin, I'd like to kind of preface everything by saying that, uh, that my recollections of the Historic Society in the 1980s uh, are really kind of a tunnel vision uh, 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 recollection. Uh, I've done a lot of different things at the Historic Society. I started out working for the preservation section. I've done a couple of archaeological projects with the antiquity section. And I've helped with, I used to put up photo exhibits around here. And I worked on museum displays and stuff like that. But, but the only place that I really feel like I have any expertise or, or that my recollections really mean anything are with the manuscript collection. Because that's what I was focused on the whole time. And... Uh, 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 partly because I've never been interested in administration and money and stuff like that. I was just glad I had Mel Smith and Max Evans and Wilson Martin to take care of that stuff so I could just go back in the stacks and do my thing, you know. So, so you have to keep in mind, uh, uh, old, other old timers will be able to have much more accurate and broader uh, recollections than I do. Um, I'm here today basically because I was given the inestimable privilege of writing the centennial history of the Historical Society in 1997. And uh, I was hoping Max Evans would be here today uh, because I wanted to thank him publicly, uh, publicly for hooking me up with the best writing gig I ever had in my whole life. It was so much fun. I interviewed all the directors of the Historic Society who were still alive. Uh, the dead ones wouldn't cooperate, so I just focused on the living ones. And uh, starting with Max and going back to Mel Smith and Ev Cooley and Chaz Peterson and, uh, and all of those. Uh, Russ Mortensen was uh, deceased by the time I got around to this, although I had known him a little bit uh, uh, at the university. But uh, his widow was uh, 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 still available and very, very cooperative. I got some really good stuff out of her. So, so I have a, kind of a direct connection with uh, the Historic Society all the way back to about 1950, and it, it, was, it was a great privilege. So, uh, so that's why I'm here today. Um, <clears throat> I have my little brown bag talk today it has a thesis, actually. And as a matter of fact, it has two theses. I know that seems awfully pretentious for a stupid little brown bag talk, but uh, <laughs> there it is. Uh, so let me give you what the theses are. Um, the, the first one has to do with the title of my presentation, The Best of Times, The Worst of Times. Uh, and uh, as I was working out that title, I was re reminded of a New Yorker cartoon from many years ago. I've been a subscriber to the New Yorkers almost since they started the magazine. And uh, uh, so here's, uh, here's the cartoon. Here's Charles Dickens uh, sitting in his editor's office. And the editor says something like that. Now, really, Mr. Dickens, if it were the best of times, it can hardly have been the worst of times, right? <laughs> uh, that really resonated with me because I myself have had editors that are about that unimaginative, you know, so, so poor Mr. Dickens. Uh, so, but, but I, I, I want to under, you to understand what it is that I'm trying to say with this. I'm not saying that we had two phases in the history of the Historic Society during the 80s, uh, that we had a golden age and all of a sudden everything went down the toilet and turned bad. Uh, that's not it at all. What I'm saying is exactly the same thing that Dickens said in A Tale of Two Cities, that the best of times and the worst of times were all intertwined together. So that uh, in the tale of two cities, you've got the, the French aristocrats who are enjoying their estates and hanging out at Versailles and sucking up to Louis XVI. That's the best of times. But then you also had the oppressed peasants who are, are working their buns off and paying too many taxes and stuff like that. If you remember, uh, if you ever saw the old black and white movie, one of the first scenes in the movie is there's a, a cart going down, bumping down the streets in Paris and a big cask of wine falls off of it 
and breaks up. And there's just literally wine running down the streets. And people are down on their knees lapping it up. And they take their socks off and they soak it up. And they're, <laughs> you know, it's just the most pathetic scene you can imagine. So the best of times and the worst of times. And, uh, you know, that did a couple of things for us. Uh, uh, when the, the, the best of times, of course, that's great. No complaints there. But even the worst of times, uh, it, it, it gave us, uh, there, there's a kind of a joy in adversity. And uh, so we just rolled up our sleeves and, and pitched in and made things happen anyway, you know. And there was just a joy de vivre of working there, even when things were bad. We kind of uh, shared a common misery. Uh, and uh, uh, also it... Uh, uh, what, what was the other one? Uh, gave us a kind of a can-do. Uh, well, anyway, uh, I, I can remember very well this uh, uh, a good example of this, and it comes not from the Utah Historical Society, but actually from an experience I had at the Arizona Historical Society, which was about the same kind of thing, uh, kind of a shoestring, low-rent operation, and I would guess about the same size as ours. And I was there doing research one time, and... Uh, and I found a letter or something. I wanted to have a copy made. And so I took it up to the young woman at the reference desk and asked if she could make a copy of it. Sure, I can do that. So she walks over to the photocopy machine, hits the button, and everything just went black, you know. And uh, I thought, man, how many times that's happened to me? So you know what she did? She just rolled her eyes and went in the back room and found another machine and did it. She just made it happen, you know. And so that's what we did. We just found ways to make it happen. Okay, the other thing, uh, my other thesis is that um, there, there was a culture at the Historical Society that we all understood that we were part of a long, great tradition, that there had been great people here, like Dale Morgan on Holly's uh, t-shirt there, uh, and, and that we were uh, uh, standing on their shoulders or walking in their footsteps and trying to carry on that great tradition. So that all the years I worked here at the Historical Society, it was never just a job. It was nothing short, and I know this sounds awfully sentimental and purple prose and all that. It was a vocation. It was a calling. Uh, it was it, it was an, it was nice that the calling had a paycheck attached to it, but but it was a calling. It was something I did out of the love of my heart, and I was conscious of being a part of that. I'm not saying that everybody who worked at the Historical Society during those years took that kind of long view of it, but it was always there, and many of us did. So, uh, so that's the other thing I want to emphasize. All right, let me uh, uh, start out by kind of uh, giving you the story of my involvement with the Historical Society. Um, I had never planned to work for the Utah State Historical Society. And all the, during the time I was in graduate school, I was barely aware that the agency even existed. I remember I had a friend who worked here, uh, Dave Atkinson, who uh, ran in. He was a, a fellow graduate student who worked at the, uh, at the library in the Kearns Mansion. And he found uh, an article one time that he thought I would be interested in and I might not be aware of. And so he invited me down to, to look at that article. So I trudged up the steps. And here was Martha Stewart in there with that big smile on her face. And she pulled out the article. And that was my only connection with the Historical Society during all the time I was in graduate school. Um, I'm not a native Utah, and I grew up on the southern Oregon coast, and I came here in 1972 to pursue my PhD at the university, and uh, I never thought I would work at the Historic Society or even that I would stay in Utah. I had hoped that I would get the degree and go back home to the coast and uh, get a teaching job there someplace, and Utah would be just a little phase of my life. Well, as I started to near the end of my graduate pro uh, program, uh, the hard truth came down to me, as it does to all of us history graduate students, that there were no jobs out there, that jobs are really hard to come by. And so a lot of you guys know about that. So I started putting out feelers and applying for jobs and stuff like that. Zero. Zero. I was getting nowhere. So at about that time, I, I, so I actually got my degree in 1977. No job. And so um, I learned that the Historical Society uh, was uh, going to hire uh, a, a group of interns. I think there were about five or six interns to work in, on various historic preservation projects. And uh, uh, I should say that at that time, uh, historical pre preservation was just driving the Historical Society. It was 
nothing short of a fad. Uh, I'm not much on fads, but that was a good fad. I'll tell you, everybody was doing that. They were restoring old houses and practicing adaptive reuse of old buildings, just the way we did in the depot over here and stuff like that. So I thought, wow, there are five or six internships. I ought to be able to get one of those. So I applied. Didn't get one. <laughs> so, so, but eventually, I kind of, uh, by virtue of the fact that I'd gotten to know Mel Smith, who was the director of the society, I think he went to bat for me and got me a job anyway. I, I, had, I got a chance to work with one of the other interns. And so I worked for the preservation section for a year, uh, writing a history of San Pete County, Utah. They had one of their biggest projects was a big push in San Pete County. They wanted to survey all of the potential historical buildings in San Pete County and they needed this overall history to kind of plug that stuff into. And so there were three of us who uh, worked on that in cooperation with some of the locals. So that was fun. Uh, the project wound up coming to grief. It didn't work out very well, but at least I was employed for a year. So after that's over, I'm back out on the bricks again. No job. So I learned that uh, uh, the Historic Society at that time had a huge backlog in their manuscript collections. And I learned that uh, they had gotten permission to create a manuscripts curator position to kind of uh, address that problem. So I thought, well, OK, I'll put my hat in the ring for that one. I love manuscripts. This would be great. So I applied for that job. Didn't get it. <laughs> so well, I'm batting, uh, batting zero now. So. Uh, uh, and the job went to a woman who had a, a pretty big national reputation in archives. And I thought, well, I can't fight that. So that's, that's just the way it goes. So I'm still flailing around trying to find something to do. Well, it turns out that she was completely impossible to live with. And she didn't even make it through a probationary period. So out of the blue, one day, Jay Heyman, who was the head of the library, calls me up, asked me if I was still interested in the job. And yeah, I'm interested in the job. So that did two things for me. In the first place, it got me my first real full-time, hard money paying job. It wasn't exactly in the field of history, but it was in archives, and that was close enough, believe me. And also it meant I was going to have to reconcile myself to becoming a Utahan. And so, so sure enough, I went out and bought a house and all this kind of stuff and settled into to become a Utah. So that's how I uh, got involved with the Historical Society. I went to work as the curator of manuscripts at the Historic Society on February 1st, 1979. And at that time, the Historical Society was in temporary quarters in the Crane Building up here at 3rd West and 2nd South, uh, the most horrible place you can imagine. That's the worst of times, OK? Uh, for many years, the Society had been located in the Kearns Mansion. Uh, and the Kearns Mansion, in about 1950, had, had willed the Kearns Mansion to the state with the idea that it would be the governor's residence. But up to that point, none of the governors had wanted to live in the mansion. And so the Historic Society moved in. and. And uh, that was that. Well, eventually, it must have been Governor Matheson came along. And he decided he wanted to live in the Kerners Mansion, and so the Historic Society booted out. So they uh, put him in the, the uh, uh, crane building uh, temporarily, and the state was able to acquire the DNRG depot over here. And so they began uh, renovating that, and uh, that was going to be our permanent headquarters. And boy, I remember coming over here one time, uh, just right after I was hired, uh, Jay and I came over here and we were kind of looking around trying to figure out where we were going to put everything in the library. And this place was the biggest mess. It was horrible. Just crap all over the floors and, and it, was, it was just the biggest. I, I walked in and I just thought, are you sure they really want to salvage this building? I mean, it was, it was that bad. So um, anyway, that was once again the worst of times. Well, what did I find when I first went to work in the crane building? Um, I found, first of all, that there seemed to be all kinds of money floating around. And uh, that was from a couple of different sources, uh, mostly uh, preservation money. We, of course, had a regular operating budget provided by the state, but there, were, uh, there was preservation money coming in. And Mill Smith, who was the director at the time, was really good at uh, finding ways of filtering some of that money out to the rest of us because there was a sense we were all in this together, you know, and the people researching their preservation projects needed the library. So we got some of that money. 
Uh, we were getting grants. We had uh, several people uh, uh, employed by federal grants. Uh, and also, uh, and the one, this is the one that affected me the most of all, uh, was President Carter's CETA program. It stands for Comprehensive Employment Training Act. Uh, he made it possible for people to uh, be employed on like one year internships uh, uh, with the uh, uh, hope of getting themselves prepared for a real job. Uh, that's how I was paid when I did the San Pete County project. I had a CETA uh, grant. And so I had a bunch of people working for me uh, who were on the, that CETA grant. Uh, <laughs> this is going to be hard to believe, I know, but I had five people working under me just in unpublished materials. I wouldn't have said that except I want to make Melissa jealous. <laughs> I think I've done it. <laughs> She's blanching. <laughs> five people. I had three people working in manuscripts, one in oral history and one in photographs, plus me. And I could work in all three and did work in all three of those areas. Uh, we were in the basement of the crane building. Uh, it was unheated. <laughs> And boy, that was a Kafka-esque place if there ever was one. Just, just cold concrete walls and uh, unheated. We would, uh, all of us had a little electric space heater. We were huddled around under our desk trying to get our fingers warmed up enough that we could type, you know. It was really, there was one telephone for everybody in the basement and that was on my desk. So I got to be the receptionist for about nine people down there. <laughs> Uh, we had, uh, me and my five people were down there. Uh, Susan Mortensen, later Susan Whetstone, was down there supervising a newspaper clipping project, if you can imagine people doing that in this day and age. And she had a couple of just like street people who were doing that. And they were, they were really, they were pretty scared. One of them got mad at her one time and pulled a knife on her, honest to God. <laughs> yeah, it, I mean, it was pretty dicey. So, so that was the worst of times, okay? <laughs> But we turned it into the best of times also. Uh, this happened just before I went to work there. The one day when Jay was out of town, the basement people went to a hardware store and bought a whole bunch of really colorful paint. And they went in there and they painted all of those big circular columns, uh, bright green and red and yellow and purple and so that. So it became very festive. And I, I can remember one thing. I don't know who did this, but uh, at the time, and none of you guys probably remember, but at that time, uh, uh, KUTV, had this stupid little promotional scheme in which people would be on the screen saying, hello, Utah, hello, Utah. And it was, I don't know what the purpose of the, how, what their advertising hook was, but it was the most vacuous thing in the world. So some guy uh, took paint. I, I don't think it was on one of the columns. It was on the wall. He wrote, hell, oh, Utah. <laughs> so it was, there was just an exuberance there that was just irrepressible. Okay, so, um, so what I did during that time was, I, the first thing I had to do was address this huge backlog in manuscript collections. Um, they, uh, they had had a temporary person who had worked there, uh, I don't think it was on a CETA program, but they had been able to hire her, and she had processed maybe six or seven or eight collections, very nice registers that had done a beautiful job with it, but that was just that many collections. Uh, I can't remember exactly how many collections we had when I was hired, but I remember the Harry Aylison collection, which was one of the most recent ones that had come in, was number B187. So we had maybe six or seven processed collections and all the rest of these that were unprocessed. So it was a really daunting task. So uh, I addressed that by getting my staff members together and we worked out a survey form uh, and it turned out being on a legal size eight and a half by 14 piece of paper. I don't know if you even see those, you still see those? And, uh, yeah, okay, okay. So we just sat down and worked out uh, as many questions as, as we could. Well, like, what would we want to know about this collection? Uh, who is the creator? Uh, how big is the collection? Uh, what kind of arrangement scheme does it have, if any? Are there conservation needs? And then we would always rate the priority. Uh, you know, this is a high priority, or this is garbage. We can just leave it on the shelf, or, or whatever. And then, and then we would go around and do it. So we just divided all 
all the, the uh, all six of us, we just divided the collection up, and each of us took a certain number of uh, uh, collections and filled out those uh, those forms, and uh, and we just gradually went at it that way. We started out with the highest priority, and then there are probably still some collections that are unprocessed that were our low priority. I don't know. <laughs> so there, so there was that. Okay, well, that was life in the, in the crane building. Then we moved into the depot, and boy, I have nothing but unpleasant memories about that move. <laughs> it was absolutely god-awful. Um, fortunately, Russell Davis brought his crew from the state library over, and they helped us move that stuff, but it was just pure physical grunt work. Everybody was dirty and tired, and, and, uh, and it broke my heart that there was inevitably a certain deterioration in the collection as a result of that. You do the best you can, but boy, every once in a while you're going to drop a rare book on the floor. You, you just can't help it, you know, and so that was, was not a good thing. So I have no pleasant memories of the, uh, <laughs> of, of the move. Uh, but that's uh, a point just slightly after that where the uh, worst of times uh, set in. I remember uh, the very first staff meeting we had here in the depot, Mel Smith said, uh, you know, we were just stacked three deep over in the crane building and just in each other's faces all the time. And that's where a lot of this exuberance came from. Come, uh, came from. You know, you get that many bright, well-educated people hanging out together, there's just all kinds of stuff going on. We had every, all kinds of jokes, the hell, oh, Utah, and stuff like that. And we just had a lot of fun. So we moved in here, and all of a sudden, we're spread out over a whole city block. And at our very first staff meeting, I remember Mel saying, look, you know, I know we're, we're spread out now, but I hope that doesn't mean that our hearts uh, uh, pull apart. And sad to say, uh, our hearts did fall apart. Uh, there, I, I was located on the north end of the building. I had very little reason to trudge all the way down to the south end of the building. And we just didn't, got to where we just didn't know each other that well. And, uh, and the upshot of it was, and it was just inevitable, it, was, it wasn't a matter of anybody being blamed for this. It was just simply a matter of geography, you know. We just kind of lost a, a large part of the cohesion uh, that we had had when we were in the crane building. Well, and then after that, uh, we had our Reagan revolution in the form of the election of Norm Bangader as governor. And um, that meant that we lost Mel Smith. Uh, Mel Smith was a very conspicuous Democrat, and the bangers regarded him as a political enemy that they kind of had to get rid of, and so they fired him. The director, I'm sure Brad is keenly aware of this, serves at the pleasure of the governor, and so uh, uh, you, you just can't get the governor irritated, and so, so there he went. And uh, so uh, after a time, after a good deal of shuffling, we got Max Evans as our director. Uh, he served for a time as state archivist and, and head of the Historical Society, and then finally just moved to the Historical Society. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I've known Max for I don't know how many years, and I still don't have any idea what his political persuasion might be, but at least it wasn't obnoxious, and that was uh, to the bangers. And so the, the best thing that Max did for us is that we survived, okay? <laughs> But during those years, we suffered all kinds of budget cuts. We lost staff members. We weren't able to hang on to a single one of those CETA people that we've been able to hire. And uh, boy, there were years in which I didn't have enough budget to buy boxes and folders. You know, it was that bad. And I used to sit there and think, good Lord, you know, why are we trying to do this anyway? If, uh, you know, if we just simply don't have the funding to, to do that basic stuff. So, uh, so I remember, uh, once again, here's the best of times. Uh, we, we used to get boxes from uh, Harold Jacobson, who was the state archivist. And these were handmade archives boxes. They kind of looked like a Hollinger box, but they weren't. Either they were stapled together. They were really crude. And we got record center boxes that weren't really, but they were uh, of the, that size anyway. They were not acid free. Uh, but they were free. <laughs> I, I, as, as I recall, I think Harold just gave them to us. Good Lord, they had so, so many boxes they needed at the state archives that the few boxes we needed here at state history was a drop in the bucket, and he just gave them to us. So we uh, started using those. Um, 
I remember, let, let's see, before I, I, I want to pursue that thought a little bit, but before I go on, I want to uh, bring up my rogues gallery of the leaders that we had during those years. And there are two names I particularly want to mention, and I wish to God that they were here today because I would just want to excoriate them. There were people I detested. First of all, <laughs> The first one was Alice Shearer, who was the head of our department, and the other one was C. McLean Haddow, Mac Haddow, who was in the legislature and responsible for the Historical Society. Those two Cretans hated the Historical Society, and they would, they would, I am absolutely convinced, have destroyed it if they could have gotten away with it. They just regarded us as a convenient source of budget cuts, and so they just proceeded to slash everything. And... Uh, uh, I, I can remember the day that Mac Haddow came down here. He, he, I guess, felt morally constrained to visit the agency that he was trying to crucify. And I don't remember who led him through the building, but I remember when he went through the library and he walked past my office, all the time he was in the library, it was dead silent. Dead silent. Nobody said anything. He walked by my office and I glared at him and he glared at me. Nobody said a thing. Alice Shearer at one point uh, made Linda Thatcher, our librarian, submit a copy to her of all of the periodicals that we were subscribing to. So Shearer could uh, tell her which ones we shouldn't be taking. You know? Now here's Linda Thatcher, a highly trained professional librarian with an MLS degree, very well in tune with the history of the Historical Society, very well in tune with the needs of our, uh, of our patrons, and Alice Shearer is going to tell her what to uh, not to subscribe. And I remember one of them that she said, you don't need to subscribe to was National Geographic. Well, I will tell you later on, I hadn't started on this project then, but later on I wrote a book called Glen Canyon and the San Juan Country. It's about southeastern uh, Utah and northern Arizona. You get that book and look in the bibliography and see how many National Geographic articles I cite in there. The National Geographic may not always have something important about Utah, but boy, they had a bunch of stuff in those days. And the idea, well, I'm just going to I'll stop ranting, okay? <laughs> My two great enemies. Um, um, let's see. Max Evans did some really great things for us. Um, one of them he did was something that I have only recently come to appreciate what a great uh, benefit it was, and that is, uh, Melissa knows what I'm talking about here, uh, MPLP, okay? <laughs> uh, this is just our code word, or LPMP, I don't never remember which way it goes. It stands for more product, less processing. And uh, this was an article in the American Archivist about 10 years ago. And there were two guys who wrote this article, and they, they said, look, are we processing our manuscript collections too much? If you've got a backlog of 1,000 cubic feet of manuscripts, does it make any sense to spend time removing staples and paper clips and stuff like that, and we're working it down to an item level description? They just said just do the best you can, get it in boxes, get at least a box level description, put it on the shelves, and I can tell you that as a historian, I don't mind going through a collection like that. It's even more fun when you get to paw through there and make new discoveries. This is something nobody's ever seen before, you know. So uh, MPLP. Uh, and Max was talking about that 30 years before those guys wrote that article. He was telling me about it. You know, are we processing our collections too much? And I thought at the time, we didn't have much of a backlog at the time. I just thought, well, that's an interesting idea, Max. It goes against all archival practice, but uh, I follow that away. Well, then the article came out, and I thought, wow, this makes a whole lot of sense. And believe me, uh, we, uh, if you can believe this, the... Uh, uh, Catholic Diocese of Salt Lake City has never had a records management program. We're going to be doing that this year. We've got hundreds and hundreds of cubic feet of records that should have been shredded or archived years ago. So believe me, over the next year, you're going to see a whole lot of MPLP at the, at the diocese and archives. That was the first thing that Max did that I loved. Uh, the a thing that he was most conspicuously known for, though, was computers, technology. Max was a computer geek. Uh, it was about the first computer geek who ever lived. 
When we were in the Crane Building, uh, we had a computer system called the Wang system, and it was really, really primitive. Uh, it used a big eight-inch floppy disk. They were like this big, and they were really floppy. They were like a piece of paper. Uh, the disk didn't hold very much. Uh, the the computer system worked okay in a sense. It, it was it was like I think we call it a dedicated system. It worked just within the network. But uh, even though it was a DOS-based operating system, it wouldn't communicate with other DOS-based uh, computers. I happen to have, uh, have found that out the hard. Way. Uh, I was working at the time on a bibliographic project with a friend of mine in Arizona, and he had one of the early uh, IBM uh, PCs, and uh, and we couldn't uh, exchange files. Uh, the Wang wouldn't read his files, and his computer, well, he didn't <laughs> didn't have an eight-inch floppy drive on his IBM, so so we just couldn't. So we just it was just a big typing job. So anyway, when we moved in here. Uh, and, and Max, uh, Melvin Smith was a great guy, but he didn't know anything about computers and he allowed himself to be kind of sold on that Wang thing. It was good in the sense that we all kind of learned basic computer skills. We learned how to create a file, how to save a file, how to delete a file, and, and stuff like that, but that was about it. So Max came in here and immediately we got new computers, good PCs, and, uh, and things were really taken off by that time. Um, so, and eventually now our catalog system is completely online and it's just, uh, we owe that to Max Evans. Okay, I'm, I'm probably way over the time I wanted to uh, talk, but, but I wanted to talk about my second thesis a little bit about the Historical Society as, as being a culture and about the tradition that we knew that we were operating within. And I had the good fortune to know several of those people who were from the old days and who passed that tradition along to me directly. Um, the first one uh, is a guy I never knew, uh, but a guy who had more influence over the historical society than anyone in his history, and that would be the guy on Holly's t-shirt, Dale Morgan. Dale Morgan died before I ever even came to Utah, so I never met him. But I will tell you, and Melissa can vouch for this, you go back in the stacks and just look at the, at the books in the library, and you are just uh, immersed in the spirit of Dale Morgan. He has his personality over all of that library. Uh, I, uh, during the 30s and 40s, he was uh, uh, helping create that library. And this was not a library of Utah history at the time because Utah history had no literature. There were about five books. And that was it. So this was general Western history. And so he was working with Marguerite Sinclair and Elizabeth Lochner here who had no training in history at all and telling them what books to buy. And the stuff they bought was out of this world. Uh, the complete set of Reuben Goldthwaites' early Western travels. I mean, Lord knows we would never be able to afford that these days. And the one that just kills me, especially since I'm a Catholic, is the, the complete set of the Jesuit relations. Now, these are the narratives prepared by French Jesuit missionaries in Canada in the 17th century. It covers about two big shelves, big, huge, expensive. They have nothing to do whatsoever with Utah. <laughs> but we got it, you know. And once again, we'd never be able to afford that today. Um, another person, and this is a person I did know very well, and that was John James. Uh, John James had been hired as the first professional librarian uh, in the 1950s. He was hired by Russ Mortensen, and, uh, and he was still here. So uh, 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 he would come in, uh, I think, on Wednesday mornings, and he would catalog manuscripts for me. So I would prepare finding aids, and I would take them up to John, and he would laboriously write out the catalog cards and then give them to Linda. And Linda had a typewriter that had, uh, this is a crazy typewriter, it was an IBM and had kind of a memory on it. So all she had to do was to type in one card and then it would uh, shuffle things around and generate the whole set of cards. So that was cool. So anyway, John James. Uh, John was suffering uh, severely from rheumatoid arthritis at the time. He could hardly walk, and you should have seen those gnarled old fingers of his. He could barely hold a pen and, and write. 
But John James is the one who taught me about arranging and describing manuscript collections. He was a very potent influence on me. And every morning, mid-morning, we would all have a break, and, and John would go into Jay's office, and Linda and Dave Merrill and I would go in there, and we would listen to John regale us of stories about the early days of the, of the Mortensen years at the Historical Society, and I felt like I was really in the presence of greatness. That was, I was starstruck. Um, the one, however, that I um, mostly admire of all of those that I knew uh, was the great Helen Papanicholas. Uh, I'm going to choke up here because I remember her with such love. Uh, I think if you look back at the volumes of the Utah Historical Quarterly, uh, you will see that only twice in the history of the quarterly <clears throat> has an entire issue of the quarterly been given over to one author. The first one was Helen Papanicholas, who did uh, Toil and Rage in a New Land, the story of Greek immigrants in Utah, and the other one was me. And, and believe me, I want to assure you, this does not put me anywhere near in the same class as Helen Papanicholas. Don't ever say that. Okay, I remember Helen Papanicholas's The Peoples of Utah came out uh, when I was still in graduate school in 1976, and it was published by the Utah State Historical Society. That book, I realized when I held that book in my hand that I was witnessing a revolution. It's the only genuine revolution, so far as I'm concerned, in Utah historiography. It's a collaboratively written book, and I was so proud that, that several of the authors in there were fellow graduate students with me. Uh, Vince Mayer, Joe Stepanovich, Phil Notariani, Ron Coleman, and maybe one or two others that contributed to that. Now, it's a history of ethnic groups in Utah uh, at, at that time. And uh, I'm not a member of an ethnic minority, and I've never written ethnic history. Uh, but I am a member of a minority. I happen to be a Roman Catholic. And I realized that Helen showed us that Utah history is about all of us. All of us. Not just white Mormon males, okay, but everybody. The Italians and the Greeks and the Yugoslavs and the Catholics and the Greek Orthodox and everybody. So that has just been a great uh, inspiration to me. And I, I've thought about her constantly once I began writing Catholic history on my own that I wouldn't be doing this if it weren't for Helen Papa Nicholas. She used to come in uh, once in a while and uh, take Linda to lunch or take Miriam Murphy to lunch and I would get to talk to her a little bit and I was just starving struck. She always got my name wrong. She always called me Jerry. But I thought, you know, I don't give a shit. You know, <laughs> she can call me anything she wants. Helen Papanicholas knows who I am. And that was a big deal. <laughs> um, well, okay, I, I think that's probably enough. There are many other people I could talk about, but uh, I'd like to get you guys talking. What uh, would you have to say to me? Uh, some of you old timers can correct my recollections or ask me questions or anything. Yeah, Brad. Gary, you, you've been uh, someone I've known since I was in college. You were the face of the manuscript area, you and Linda Thatcher. Uh, Brad was just a kid when I first met him, honest to God. <laughs> and at the time, you were, I looked at you as, wow, this a manuscript curator, what a, what a great career you had. In many ways, what I did was based on some of the things that you did and watch, me watching you. Wow. As you look now at the society and, and all that's accomplished during your time here, but also now in the last 20 years as a library, I mean as a professor of history uh, and as an archivist and a historian for the Diocese of Utah, what advice could you give us for the future? How can we frame up and do as well as you've done in the past? Well, I would just preface by saying I think you guys are doing a heck of a job. Uh, I am very impressed with the Historical Society. Uh, I don't use the society as much as I used to, but every time I come in here, boy, you guys find what I'm looking for and I feel like I'm treated really well. Uh, technology, you've got high-tech stuff. Uh, <laughs> last time I was in the library, I was trying to use a newspaper microfilm and they got these computers that are hooked up to the thing. I couldn't figure out how to, I'm going to have to bring a 10-year-old kid in with me to show me how to do it. Or actually, I'll bring my niece, Ashley Pike, who's, she's our family IT person. She's the one who fixes our computers when they go bad. And so so I, th I think you guys are doing a great job. I'll tell you, uh, the, the one thing I would advise, though, is what I'm emphasizing here at the last. 
I don't care whether you work here or whether you use the facilities or the resources of the society, and I presume that that includes virtually everybody in the room, uh, the degree to which you can familiarize yourself with that history and that tradition so that uh, you'll realize that this is a very special place to work, and, uh, and it'll just make your job and your, and your using the collections all that much better. You know, I remember uh, all the time that we were here, Linda and I were aware of the fact that our counterparts in other institutions were bad-mouthing us. We were the low-rent, hand-me-down outfit, you know, and, and they were even telling people not to give their, not to donate their papers to the Historic Society. Oh, those guys will lose them or they'll destroy them. Or, that's just unethical as all get out. So we were being bad-mouthed for being this low-rent sleazy, which we were. That's exactly what we were. <laughs> and, uh, but I also noticed that every time we have a jo had a job opening, all those people would apply for the job. <laughs> they recognize that this is a very special place to work. <laughs> so, what else? Yeah. How did uh, having an Amtrak here uh, influence or impact the, the society? Not at all. Their schedule was that those trains would leave at about 4 o'clock in the morning, so there was nothing going on here while we were here. I think the ticket office was open, and that's just about the size of it. So, yeah, it was, uh, I mean, we, we thought it was cool working at this old railroad station, but uh, uh, no, it didn't, uh, have, had no effect that I could tell. I wasn't around here at 4 o'clock in the morning, I can assure you. <laughs> yeah, Gary? Um, only in that I've written a bunch of articles for it, and, uh, and also I served on the advisory board of editors. Uh, I think Stan told me at one time that I had served on that editorial board longer than anybody but Hal Schindler, and, and I think I passed Hal Schindler even. So, so But in terms of, uh, uh, I guess I'm probably more involved with the quarterly now than I was then, because every once in a while Holly and Jed will send me an article to ask me what I think of it, you know, and, uh, but that, that's about it. Yeah? Uh, did you get a lot of questions about the Purple Lady back then? <laughs> uh, I was aware of the Purple Lady, but this is a, supposedly a ghost that... Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> did you know anybody who seen the Purple Lady? <laughs> no, I didn't. I did I not. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't know whether I believe in ghosts or not, but I had other things to worry about than the purple lady. <laughs> okay, well, yeah. Is there a collection that's particularly memorable for you? Um, it was already here in part when I was hired, and that would be the papers of Juanita Brooks. Um, we had part of her papers and then we acquired the rest of it uh, actually a long time before she died and uh, actually she was another person I wanted to talk about as being an influence uh, I met Juanita Brooks once uh, Jay and I had gone to St. George for some other purpose. I think it was to pick up the papers of Carl Larson, another historian in Washington County. And uh, so Juanita was not doing very well by that time. And she was living on the same property as her son Carl and his wife. And they were kind of the gatekeepers to Juanita. Uh, but Jay had known Juanita very, very well. Jay had taught at Dixie College and so had Mel. That's where they had, they had met. And they used to have meetings. Uh, there were a bunch of kind of liberal Mormons they would get together and bitch about things. And, and uh, so they, they, they knew each other very well. So, so Jay went and asked Carl's wife if we could uh, drop by and see Juanita. And uh, she said, sure, just go on down. So we went down there. and We talked to her for a good part of the afternoon. And I could tell that she was in and out. She eventually uh, suffered from uh, Alzheimer's. And, and she was, had her lucid moments and her moments that were not so lucid. But man, I didn't care. I was there in the presence of Juanita Brooks. And I was just a starstruck teenager, you know? Couldn't believe it. I gave her my business card. She was the first person I gave one of my business cards to. And you know what? When we got the rest of her papers in, here was my business card. Juanita Brooks remembered who I was. I couldn't believe that. And I remember, that here's a great story for you. You know, when she wrote The Mountain Meadows Massacre, she just became persona non grata in Washington County and Iron County, too. Everybody turned against her. She was just revealing all these secrets that nobody should have been involved in. And uh, 
And she and, and her husband, Will, were just shunned. Uh, they wouldn't ask him to offer prayers and meetings. They wouldn't offer, uh, let him teach classes. Uh, they never disfellowshipped or anything like that. They just kind of put them on the shelf. And, uh, and I, I remember as we were leaving, Juanita opened the door and she showed me a place right beside the door where she used to keep her gun. And she told me, this is, she all of a sudden became very lucid. She looked at me with those flashing black eyes and she says, very meaningfully, and it wasn't to protect me from the Gentiles. <laughs> it's probably a line she used to wow all starstruck teenagers, but, uh, <laughs> but it got me, <laughs> worked in my case. <laughs> Well, that's all I have. Thank you.